Next stop on our movement through French architectural history is modernism. And the key individual that we're gonna speak about today in terms of French modernism is a man who was born, Charles Genere. But his nom de plume, how is he known in, in the public world uh, since his early days as a young architect is the Le Corbusier. And in his name alone, as he adapted this new moniker is a great explanation of how he perceived architecture. So he is the and whatever a Corbusier is, because that's not a ancestral word in his family. It's not an object. It's not, a, it's not an actual thing in French vocabulary. He is just this thing that creates architecture. And that's what he believed when he formulated his, his strain of modern language was the premise for his ideas is that this pen is an object for drawing with ink inexpensive, a clip for your pocket. This pencil is a pencil that can move from 0% to 100%. It also has its organizational ideas. It is engineered to be a pencil that looks like a pencil from the birth of pencils. So it's well hewn and is a designed object as well. Glasses that some of us wear are things that let us see better, read better, and they are structured to face a functional aesthetic as well as an image in terms of its, its looks on a person's face or so there's choice involved. But by and large, ergonomically, glasses are glasses. Something to cut paper, something to highlight. All these objects, a scale to measure, are utility and they're beautiful in their own right because they're engineered to its purpose of economy and function and therein lies the art form itself. So an architect can also be in a sense, a product, a thing, a device that does something for society. And that's how he felt about the residence is that instead of incorporating nostalgia and detail and ideas from the past, it really needs to work from the mechanics of how a house is used and performed. So over the course of the 1920s, he worked, he left his native Switzerland, showed a phone in, in Switzerland and came to Paris because that really was the arts culture at the dawn of the 20th century. So he came there and met a lot of authors, musicians, people engaging in this language of the, the modern movement between basically 1910 and about 1960, when it becomes postmodern, maybe we're still in the modern movement, we're just sort of labeling different strategies for the modernism. So the probing question is, what is the piece of art? In the past, it's designed by its religious use or content politically in the 20th century, it becomes to define an object uh, with no purpose other than to give us visual enjoyment to the viewer or to be thought provoking. So given the atrocities of World War I, which I mentioned in our last sketch, to come back and to create kind of a psychoanalysis, many European artists felt that the realities of modern life can no longer be exchanged by traditional means because they represent war, they represent territory, they represent an aristocracy. So you know the artists, Pablo Picasso, George Brock, other famous Western culture modernists, believed in compositions of the paintings would work in monocolor, like a single color or with primary colors only. Artists expressed their hopes and fears about the modern life through different means. And so Corbu is doing this to, as people return from the front and realize we have to upheave our political system, our social structure, there needs to be an identity that follows through with that. And so these three models here kind of go through a stepping stone in time here where he advances that notion. And they all share some common thread. The one you know probably clearly here in its square shape plan is the Ville Savoy, which is his 
most celebrated single family residents from 1929. And so we'll talk about that in a second. Some of the process buildings that came to that, he also did, did a project of a raised home, a three-tiered home for the Wiesenhof, which was a housing exhibit of all the young modernists in Stuttgart around the same time in the mid to late 20s. And along the way, he found individual clients like here at the Villa Garsh that let him experiment with their money and their purse to create some modern pieces of economic restraint and yet really prolific ideas about contemporary ideas of space relative to the, to the uh, single family residence. So this is in suburban Paris, this is in Stuttgart, and then this is out also in suburban Paris to the west, which will take a train out to Poissy and see this sitting on its plot of land out in suburban Paris. So we can explain kind of the language of this and homes that he's worked on in a series of principles that he sort of brings out eventually through five points that guide his architecture. So number one would be there needs to be the first floor raised up off the ground. And so he wanted to have people off of the dampness, the wetness, the cold, the sort of utility of the ground plane and live the flight up. And with that, you wanna have a free elevation, a free facade that allows you to see in any position around the horizon line. So the structure has to free up the idea of punched windows and go to banded windows. And to do that, you raise this up to free up the ground plane so it's more useful. You use pelotes or structure that create sort of um, the thighs or the base for the architecture to stand on. So another point is there is a fifth elevation, one, two, three, and four. And the fifth is now because coming back from World War I, a lot of people projected that the next way buildings are gonna be seen are from the air. And certainly there's, there's a lot of aviation growth, not quite till yet where people are looking down as that as a fifth elevation, but he saw on the smaller planes flying closer to the ground that that actually is part of the canopy of composition for the architect. And so those systems involved in the points that bring this up create then a kit of parts to change the way people live and modulate around their home. So in point, point in case for this, when you approach the home on the front elevation, there actually is a drive on the right side and the drive is to eventually park the car, not in a standalone garage within the frame of the home itself. And it travels around the right side and there's a bend in the wall, the lower level. And that comes around to the opposite side where there's angle parking. And the radius of that arc down there is the turning radius of a typical French car at that time. So the automobile itself takes a place that's much more dominant in 1920s in French life, Western culture life, certainly American life as well. But then when you rise up, whether it's by a spiral stair or a ramp to get to the second floor, the first floor of the piano nobile for the people, it's a dominant space where technology provides a new type of free lifestyle, which is egalitarian. So the model is white, but the home is white as well because white is a neutral color, it's not nationalistic. The forms are technologically based on the building construction, the identity of the function itself. So it's not tied to an image of a past historical period. And then on top, sort of the sculpture garden, when you take the final ramp up to the roof terrace, it's an open air so that part of your land you're playing for is the roofscape too. So roofscapes now will be flat. So you have an extra floor plan that you're sort of coveting as you raise up from the first to the second floor and to the top of the model. So that system then is something that happens in all these spaces and the different types of diagrams as he moves from his earlier phase back in Chaudefon in Switzerland, where he's a younger architect, kind of dabbling with some classical language, kind of looking at some interest into modularity and some ideas of material. But it's not until he reaches his purest phase, which is his own uh, mantle for calling this this idea of taking the, the purest qualities of architecture, the intent of the function to a higher order. So that purest phase then goes all the way to the 30s. And we'll talk about what happens after the 30s towards his major fourth phase. But for now, we're kind of ensconced in talking about the purest language of Le Corbusier. So we're going to start with the pattern of a home that we're going to visit, which is now the foundation of Le Corbusier in the 16th arrondissement of Paris. So as we spiral out from the center, the 16th finance on the west side, 
across the river from the Eiffel Tower. And this is more of a developing area, more on the periphery of the existing Paris. So the land's a little bit cheaper. So it's easier to build younger people, people that support the modern movement. There's more pieces like this of Corbu's piers in the 16th and any part of the city. So what happens in the architecture here is that there is a dual home that is split down really in a piece of land that's buried inside a city block where it's deep and long. So coming from the entry with your automobile, the notion is that you pull into the lot proper and the architecture, and then there's a block of housing that's split between two owners that share the property, with its garage, and then more of the public space back tucked in the corner, which has its view out to a raised first floor beneath here. So sort of a floor level garden, not putting the building on the entire plat here, which you closed it off. Now the architecture is lifted. So from your view, you look right across to more planted trees in the back. And so there are three gentle columns here, the Pelotes that raise that. And this is about 1922. So he's before he's re completely resolved all these issues at the Villa Savoy where he has more of his manifesto about the ideas. So the, the, the spaces themselves are very cubic, very straight and organized, and they show a very simplicity to the language of how the building is going to be used. And then some of the celebration inside in terms of detail or sort of the, the minimalist quality of the architecture is in the technological spirit of it, for instance, of how you would mount the stairs and rise up to the second floor, or we come over here to this piece, which is an element of surprise for most of the people that visit it. It's actually the only curvilinear wall here to call out something special behind that skin on the second floor. And that's the art gallery, the place where they could actually uh, present and display the contemporary art at the time. And that's raised up in Pelodi, so it's a celebrated place of the type of massing there. So in terms of your homeowner, you can give and play with the function of it and then have the modulation of the architecture kind of respond to that. So is he tucked into a very hard end of the property here, hard on this side, so it slips into a neighborhood and then rises out and it's completely in, in high contrast with its neighbors from the earlier century. So what's most important to us then, and again, I wanted to get to the point that this also has a ramp that takes you down into the space or back up into the second floor up here as this terrace is up. So this little L shape is just a way to show the expansion idea, this purest quality and code of moving forms on, on, on part of the space on the inside. But what we're gonna look at in, in more detail here is then the view once you're in the space and you're on the circulation route that you move through the house in the interior, which faces the court where the cars drive into their garage area, but up above, it is a, a sort of a catwalk circulation spine above the first floor. So what you want to do is simply extend those out so we can find our eye height here. So when you converge those left and right points, that's the height of an individual at the end of that sort of catwalk area. So you walk under beneath it and come into a large two and a half story volume on the right. So when we get done, you'll see the very playful language the connection between indoor and outdoor light, natural artificial lighting, and the play of space, and the change of color and material that brings a lot of vibrancy to these volumes. So it may seem like kind of a sterile, almost utilitarian series of forms and a series of architecture he's working on. The play of interiority and the relationship to the outside is sort of a very progressive way to think about a, a non-articulated form of architecture, or at least a, a new modernist vision for that articulation. So what we're going to do is just pull off from that initial vanishing point some of the key lines which structure the space. So if we're walking from this direction, that's our view shed to this opening now. And so this will take us to that point where the person is standing and there's a threshold that we'll walk through at this point. Off to our left is a glass skin again that receives light from the north and then lets that drift down because it's not direct sunlight into the main uh, volume that connects the whole home together. So there's a series of 
almost um, high-tech factory type of sash frames. They're not highly decorative. They're not wood trim. They're very, uh, you'd see in more utilitarian buildings back in the day and not seen in residential architecture. So he pulls those out as being symptomatic of the, the functional aspects of a Corbusian building. And they'll drop down. And then sometimes they'll break their pattern to show where one might be operable. And the one that's the body between the two flats of windows here is a broader piece of structure received by a broader piece of structure at the base. And then finally received by a little channel up top. And that's the definition of the entire ornamental system of the modern language as seen through the eyes of Le Corbusier. So you can understand now that if you have a very ornate, powerful, flowery, decorative pen, that's one thing. If you just want a paper made flare, that's where you're pushing towards the idea of these small villas that Corbusier is doing for people, the intelligentsia, the artists, the designers of the time that could afford and, and use and let uh, Corbusier use them as a client to perform this agenda in three dimensions. And then outside, we see the base of this curvilinear wall to our left. And so it comes out flat first and then starts to arc. And the arc will be gentle here because we're pretty close to our horizon line with it. And it's a little bit broader of the arc up here. So that comes down and then squares off with the rest of the building right about there. And then in there, simply to show, here's the view shed, here's what I want you to look at. There will be another way to kind of compose the elevation by coming through and popping in pinched sections of window and glazing. This one will be a little bit higher up for the arc of that gallery level, but it follows the flow of that curvilinear aspect up there. So he pops in that fenestration. So you have a view from the inside to the outside, to the inside again. And then in the distance, we've got this channel of windows that pulls through and a ribbon of vertical sashes that runs across the backdrop here. And then like will eventually flower to in the Villa Savoy, the intent was you don't walk up to a framed vertical window and have your horizontal line obstructed because we see greater in the horizontal field the way our eyes are aligned on our, on our face. So in this case, most of the windows here are long and uh, longitudinal. So when we come outside, we could then project that beneath our eye height, there is a deeper tone to get some distance through those metal supports for the glazing. So now we sort of pulled us from where we're seated up close here and walking towards that secondary room back there. Maybe we'll give a dark tone there for the person against that wall. And then it comes to the base of that and turns and goes to the other room adjacent to it. So we can then vary the tone pattern again for our functional economic persons, it's a, a hard tile, it's a darker tone, and that way the play of the bright white walls makes it more of a contrast. So that tone will simply wash here across the whole floor line and we'll stop right where we get to the base of this wall to the right. So we'll simply wash that first and we'll start to see how this pulls out in three dimensions. And that's kind of a placeholder for now. We'll play with the values and how light strikes that floor in a little bit. But now we sort of have this, this tongue of opening that takes us to a compilation of kind of a volumetric play, almost childlike volumes, where he, he would study the history of the Greek Doric temple or the power of a, of a steamship liner from the same time period and awe at their engineering simplicity that they're just sort of been faceted down to just their purpose itself. 
And so you saw the homes as being really, the ornament can go away and the performance of the house is even richer because it's just the components that make it a home. So the spectacle of coming up the stair at the top of the first landing, it actually projects out back into the space and floats above it. So that's what we see over the edge of our railing here. And the rail goes up to a lower height compared to the body height, the very sort of finish wall. And then to get it to sort of more of a code and more of a safety issue, he rises up some contemporary piping, which to most people would have been sort of um, inappropriate type of material for a single family residence, but ends up being sort of a striking contrast to what history has given so far in terms of residency. So here's our little bit of railing going back down to the second floor and the projection off of this corner, which wraps around the room. So turning the corner, it could take you down that stair back into the uh, first floor foyer. But to complete that, that box that flies above and now that space, which is actually above the second floor, which can take you into the gallery back down. We have yet another one of these above us, these rails that goes across and we see now the final height of the big interior volume. So the sort of sobriety of the outside, the very sort of sugar cubic block-like aspect, almost childlike, becomes a rich play of three-dimensional forms and spaces if they're floating by themselves. A lot of the, the architects, designers back then were also engaged in filmmaking. And they liked the idea that when you think of a film, it's a whole series of still images. And so we're looking at a still image at the Maison La Roche here, the foundation of Corbusier. And yet we're in a film, you're seated watching the movement. In architecture, you're actually in a film too, but the image is still and you're moving through it. So if you're moving through it, all these images are changing along with you. So in a sense, he's trying to create a filmic experience of exposing people to the movement and the volume of space and not just the image of it on a planar wall. So to help pull this wall in front of us, we'll know the underside of the ceiling receives less light from the outside. So we can take this part and make that a bit darker, which will turn the light on, so to speak, more of the outside skin. And then actually tones here, and over the years, they've varied the colors of the foundation. But uh, Corbeau is also a painter and a sculptor, and it has certain sort of go-to color palettes and ideas about the relationship of color as decoration in itself, the beauty of the color itself. So on this back wall is, is a different type of tone than simply just the white and back. So we'll make that a little bit darker next to our person. And then the left side, it's, it's an access to the second floor here. So it's got an entry door over here and takes us all the way up to the front of that space. And so now it actually seems like we push back another room about 25 feet deeper in the paper. And at this scale, that's a lot of movement for a flat piece of paper. And now that room continues behind this, this front panel that's been opened up to us. And the, the walls are intentionally very thin, so they seem like, they're, like you're walking through a model that really forces this issue of a new striking kind of spirit in architecture. So this edge is stronger because it's going to be a little bit darker as this comes back to our vanishing point, the bottom of this box, and finally stops so that we're gonna see a dark glow from this edge kind of be washed out now by receiving light from the entry foyer. So the underside is a tone that comes down and meets that, but then we wanna change the plane between the underside and this, they're both darker, but one has to be darker than the other, so it changes the direction of how light is traveling. And we want, because this is fluid in space, we don't want to attach to the sidewall. So we're going to continue from here if the light comes in and washes this kind of an ambient light, because it's the north side, it'll wash out a little bit of a cast shadow around this volume. It's going to go back in the plane in space. So we just put a little hint of the gray there to show that it's not touching the wall, but floats by it. And finally, as the stair wraps down, we see its final side for us kind of cut down. Let's see, that is here. 
So there's the rest of the stair coming down over here. And that's going to be much darker because it's the same tone as this tile. So now we have this pathway of movement just by these cubes in space. And probably because this section of this projection is perpendicular to the light source, it's brighter than the one that's right around the corner. They're both well lit and white, but we still owe it to come to this edge and put in that little bit of a gray tone to make sure we turn that corner. So any given plane may look like it's the same tone and color, but we know with sketching on a two-dimensional plane, we need to animate that it's the white actually appears darker because this white's actually even brighter. So that's gonna receive the light. So we come inside here, this is gonna be a bit more reflective because we're going outside looking into glass there. So we could put a little tone because the interior is a little bit darker, but don't worry about it too much because our focus is right here in the center third of it. Now be beneath this on the Pelotes, we see two of them in the yard. There's one that drives down and meets our base here. So that's a good kind of end of the sketch. And then one in the distance. But we're looking down on uh, a gravel slash grass plane here. So this whole zone between our rail and the movement of how the, the glass is broken up here is a much darker tone too. So we can take that and wash between the two pelotes and over here as it travels next to our window mornings. And that'll help keep this float off the ground here. And what can help that out is it is not on the edge of the building, it's recessed a bit so that the squarish form of this is going to have a shadow line and then a darker side to it. And this one's much further back, so that whole piece there is darker. And that'll make these supports feel like they're underneath this actual plane there. So a last little bit of detailing this because we're if something this clean and pure, it's a simpler type of sketch, a little complex with volume, but you still want to play with your value to make it work in its procession of, of the playfulness is this coloration here. We'll go up to, it looks like in, at least in a black and white image, it's a darker tone up above. And that will be the height of the ceiling in the space above this half wall. And then he employs a deep skylight through the roof section to let light in from the upper plane as well. So he would begin to treat the ceiling plane as if it was a wall itself. So here's kind of our, uh, once we kind of work with a little bit of playful language up top here, we're going to kind of lower the ceiling now because the least amount of light hits this plane. It might bounce up and lighten it up, but we have to start with from this corner over, one more wash around this skylight because the skylight has to be white to make it look like it's letting light into the space. So we simply wash around there and we can let it diminish towards here because now this backspace here is driving light over there. And that'll be towards the end of our middle third anyway. So we don't want to stop that value. But then here's, here's how it works in terms of its composition. And this is how the other abstract artists coming back with a really um, resolute idea to upheave the status quo of the 19th century and the status of society, because basically the wealthy sent the poor to the front. So when the poor who remained came back, they realized they weren't going to go back to the same world. And so this is a great systematic way of showing the future of what a more common a non-nationalistic type of architecture, universal idea could be employed. So a good way to kind of test this, we don't do this on most sketches because they're very placed in terms of gravity, is that the language of this art, if you look at it as an abstract piece, let's say it's a painting or a sculpture, almost has the same spirit, no matter how it's viewed. So that the composition and the idea of the art form itself is integral to the ability of having no gravity, no iconic thing that says start here and end there, just the spirit of the space itself holds its value as an abstract composition, which becomes the, the coder for the modern movement. So what we'll do to kind of break the end, sometimes when you have lineal pieces, 
two dimensional pieces and they're not really sort of determinedly end at the end, it washes our three dimensional effort and kind of back to 2D really quick. So a good way to stop that is to take some of the grid of the tile work and run that across just the, the construction joints there between the pieces. They can dissipate to just the tone itself. When it gets closer, we'll make those marks a little stronger. So that it's nice to kind of end it with a form instead of a series of lines that kind of turn out. And that way, we know we can kind of stop our sketch right here then as we get closer to us and corner that out. And so it kind of gets received at the base. On this side, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because this white plane continues actually behind us then too, because the ramp connects to the other side of the property. So that's a little bit more difficult. So we can pull this wall off of that wall by saying around that corner from here on up, it's gonna receive less light. So the gray gets darker and darker and darker until you come to here. And that'll pull this wall off of that back wall. Same is true to get movement from this side to that side. We know the light's gonna come in and warm up that wall. But in this case, it's gonna be darker on this edge of it until we kind of let it go and value it out to the right. So this is the same plane that goes out here and jogs a little bit. So this brightness now seems more powerful because it's exterior white compared to the interior planes over here until we get to the point where we want it to perform again. So a little bit of movement here with an angle coming here and making it a little bit stronger. We'll throw that shadow line a little bit. Down here, we could throw that shadow line a little bit towards that area because that sits in that corner. And if we like, we could have somebody then in this little parapet at the same eye height as this person. They're on the same plane. They're just on landing there as it starts to procession out. So we can put that person right about there looking over and enjoying the view inside the Maison La Roche. <laughs>